So uh, I welcome everybody again after I, this mini break. I think we have a question because uh, uh, we have a hand raised. Yes. Are the, yeah, please. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, I, so before the next, I, uh, I'm trying to look. So I have a few questions. And uh, before the initiation start, I thought I, I, should, I should ask that again. So the first I have question been... is uh, from, hello, hello. Can you, can you hear me? So, I cannot hear you. I Sorry, I cannot hear you. It, it would be much better maybe to write it in the chat room. That's uh, great difficulties. Hi, Jan. Uh, thank you very much for your question. We have some noise in your voice. So maybe if you log out and log in again, uh, okay. that would be corrected. OK. I will, okay. I will, I will try. Thank you. Uh, if, yes. OK. <clears throat> OK, shall I go on? Yep, please. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Yes, then uh, uh, I just talked about the operator splitting method, and we will start with the advection term L1 here, let's say. With the advection term here, we will start first. Okay. If you only look at the advection part of the hydro equations in 1D, we can see the following structure we have on the left hand side the time derivative of the density, momentum density in 1D in the x direction, and energy density in the bottom equation here. On the right-hand side, we have now only the advection terms, okay? And they're always proportional to the fluid velocity u here. So we have these three equations for 1D hydro here. We can write them as a vector equation in this way here in so-called conservative form. As I've explained to you before, we have a time derivative plus a spatial derivative of the fluxes, which I call F here. So F would be the mass flux, momentum flux, or energy flux here. And this is equal to zero because we're only dealing with the advection step first. So we have three components here, U1, U2, U3, and F has also three components. And for our 1D hydro equations, we have here U1 is equal to rho, U2 is equal to rho times U, momentum density, U3 is energy density, rho times epsilon. Okay, and if you look in, in, at the equations above here, uh, you can see here that rho times U is, F, is F1, F2 is rho U U, the nonlinear part, and F3 is rho epsilon U. So F, F3 is also nonlinear because epsilon and rho and, and U are also both variables, and the product of it will make it nonlinear itself. So in this step, in the advection step now, we are dealing with the first operator part of our equation. So we are going to update rho n to rho 1. And here we have already reached the new time step since there's no other source terms for the density. While, on the other hand, we have gone from un to u1 and epsilon n to epsilon 1 here. Here we are still missing for these two variables, epsilon and u, we are still missing the second operator. That's why we have not reached the full time step n plus 1 yet but we are only at the intermediate step one, denoted by one here, okay. Advection step, force terms would then come, the second part, so this is the general layout of the equations here. The second part contains for the momentum equation just the pressure gradient here, okay, and in discretized form, it would look like this here, I've just written it out here. And for the energy equation, we have here the epsilon over dt is just p over rho, du over dx, it's our equation here, in discretized form, it would look like this here, okay? So here we are going from u1, p1, to un plus 1, and pn plus 1, or epsilon n plus 1 here, okay? So on the right-hand side here, the variables here, all have, all are at the time level 1 here, so at the intermediate level, okay? while rho here is already at the time level n plus 1, 
Okay, so these would be the four steps here. Uh, but now we have the interruption. We need, no. uh, sorry. Uh, well, uh, Sion one, wants to ask uh, his question. Sion, please yes. ask your question. Thanks. Yes. Hello, am I audible? Yes, it's better now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the thing is that I have few questions. In mm -hmm. in slide number in slide number ten, if you if you could go back to slide number ten, yes. In the yeah, in the in the last uh, integration part, you have mm -hmm. said that uh, shy n j is piecewise constant. So yes. means is it is it piecewise constant here? Because if we take shy n uh, comma n uh, delta t part out of the integration, then it would stay piecewise constant, right? Because for for this part, we can use yes. any sort of PPM or PCM, any sort of algorithm to calculate yes. the size. Yes. Right. Means, is, yeah. it, is it piecewise constant here or we I mean, have to this, do something? In, in this example here, yes. I mean, the, here the function psi jn, that's piecewise constant. But on the right-hand side, this function on the right-hand side does not need to be piecewise constant. Okay, yeah. means if we, if we, uh, we can take yeah. this function, uh, we can take the integrand out of the integration and that means if we, if we take shy to be constant in between this j minus half yes. uh, yeah. and j plus half, then we can yeah. take but, it out. Then but as I said, as I said, sorry, this fun here in the integral, yeah, hmm. this <laughs> function does not need to be piecewise constant. But I mean, these oh. variables oh. here on the left side, okay. psi j, this is a piecewise constant bar so whatever bar so whatever thing uh, we want to choose we can choose for this shy x n t but uh, the shy yes. n g would remain piecewise constant for that Maybe. yes i will come to this a little bit later hold on there will be an example where you can see how it varies yes okay okay, okay. another question is uh, in yes. slide number 11 you mm -hmm. have uh, said that uh, the stencil, the length of the stencil will decide that we would see shock or not. So uh, I, I couldn't understand this part. So if you if you could elaborate on this. I will come to this also in a moment, OK? This was just already going advanced a little bit. Yes, I will come to also. Sorry, I will come to these questions in a moment, OK? OK, OK, OK. thank you. Yeah? Thank you. Will be answers. Just hold on. Yeah, they are very good questions. They will be answered in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Sian. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, yeah. Sorry that I postponed the answering of these questions, but I will come to this in a moment. So, we are, now we are coming uh, to the advection equation, and um, this I will I will go through this a little bit in more detail because the project I've put on the web page asks you to solve this advection equation for a simple 1D linear problem here. And I will now explain how to solve it, okay? So we have the continuity equation was given like this, okay? Where Fm was the mass flow, u rho times u, mass flux, mass flow, okay? So here we have, we use some generic variables, psi again, yes, to make it as a, it's in the script for the project. We denote rho, equals to psi and u equals to a, where a is now constant, okay? If a is constant, that means u is constant, we have a linear advection equation and we can pull out the u of this derivative, okay? Then we have this equation here and this is called a linear advection equation, where u is a constant velocity, yes? And the solution of this equation is known analytically. So this can serve as a test problem for your favorite numerical method that you are trying to uh, uh, create and you want to be as accurate as possible. So you're testing your equation on this equation. problem here. So initially at t equals zero, we have it given as a function f of x here, okay? And then at time t later, this profile that you had initially, f of x, is just transported with the, velo with the fluid velocity a to the right if A is positive or to the left if A is negative. So at a later time, yes, the analytical solution is just given by the, by the initial profile F just shifted by uh, a, a distance A times T, okay? And this is perfectly 
let's say, a, a perfect analytical solution and you would like to have the numerics to keep this property of the analytical solution as accurately as possible. That's the goal and that's what you will be doing, hopefully, in, in the um, problem set P1, number one. Okay. How to solve this? There are different schemes. I will first briefly discuss a very simple looking scheme for this equation, which is called forward time centered space. And it means what it says, okay? You step, this is the equation, number 30. This is the grid. So here you have, let's say, xj, psi j at the same grid point, xj plus one, psi j plus one. So this would be your spatial grid, okay? But as you, as you will see, if we have a constant, if we have constant variables, constantly spaced grid points, sorry, constantly spaced grid points, uh, we don't really need the actual locations xi in our difference equations, uh, just delta x will need, as you will see. So we write for the time derivative as before, we just write this here. This is very simple. For the spatial derivative here, you can see we need the spatial derivative at the midpoint here. So to have a spatially centered scheme, we take psi j plus one minus psi j minus one here, okay, on the, in this equation here, dividing by two delta x. That's our spatial derivative. And then we get to this scheme here, psi j plus one, psi j minus this expression here, which contains the spatial derivative here. This method, as I write down here, looks very well motivated. It looks nice. You have a spatially centered derivative on the right-hand side, which means it is second order in space and first order in time. But the scheme is unstable for all delta t, so it's not usable, okay? And this is the problem with quite a few uh, numerical schemes in uh, or schemes in numerical hydrodynamics. You, they look very nice, Yes, and they're, they're derived from the equations by Taylor expansion. So this is a Taylor expansion of the equations, uh, but they are unstable, okay? Uh, and that is a problem, of course, and so this scheme is not useful here, forward time centered space. Um, we come now to the upwind method, okay? You could improve on this and use here forward time, let's say non-centered space and so on. This is the upwind method here. The upwind method changes the right-hand side of the equation here. So we have this, this is our model equation here again, written in two different forms, okay, where A would be the constant velocity. This is the conservative form, equation 34, equation 35 is the non-conservative form here where you have pulled out the velocity out of the spatial gradient here, okay. And this method here that I explained to you now works also for all advection problems, okay? It's, it's a sample equation here for the density, but if you plug in for psi, you can plug in rho times epsilon. It's the same method for the energy equation. Or you can plug in rho times u, and then you have the same method for the momentum equation. So this is very generic, the scheme. It can be used for all of the variables, okay, as well. And now we write here, we take now the individual grid cells as some box, yeah? And you imagine now you have mass in this box, and this is the mass advection equation here you are looking at, okay? So we have here J minus one here, the grid cell J minus one, grid cell J, grid cell J plus one here, okay? We're looking now at the change of the mass in grid cell J. Now, the velocity A is positive, okay? Which is written here, it's positive. That means all the mass flows to the right, okay? I don't know, my hand moves probably to the left, okay? <laughs> moves to the right and to the positive x direction, okay? That means the mass in cell J changes because you have mass inflow from the left, which we call F in, uh, in here, and mass outflow on the right, which we call F out here, okay? And the mass which flows from the left here is given by this purple colored volume here. So this comes back to the question. I will come back to this question here. If we assume we have a constant density here, then exactly this material which is inside this box will be transported to the right. And it, exactly this material which we have here, which is in this box, will be transported out of this box again, 
Okay, so this is exact if the mass distribution is constant in each grid cell, this would be the exact transport of mass here, which is contained here in this cell here. So we can change, we can look at the change of our mass here, which is density, let's assume size density. So density times delta x, density times volume here is the mass here at time n plus one, is mass at times n, minus the difference or plus the difference of the fluxes that go in and out. And this is very natural. I mean, if you look at the mass change in a box in a room, for example, here in, in my office here, the mass change goes through mass fluxes through the surfaces of the of this room, okay? And this left surface is here at this point here, and the right surface of this grid cell is at this point here. But this whole procedure works also in three-dimensional space. Obviously, so the, the, the mass which changes in a box is given by the mass flow across its boundaries, okay? And this is given by this expression here on the right-hand side. So the flux Fn is, const, is for constant J, so if, if we have const, piecewise constant function here, then we have F in, as I said, is just A times the density here, and F out is A times this density on the right-hand side here, okay? And this is, and this method we call the upwind method, and we call it the first order upwind method. I will explain to you this in a minute, okay? So this is, has very clear physical meaning, this method here. It's physically motivated meaning here, okay? And yeah, for non-constant values, this was the question uh, we heard uh, a, a few minutes ago. Uh, of course, this is a very crude approximation to have piecewise constant functions here. Now we assume we have piecewise linear approach here. So we can correct this slope here, okay? From the initially constant value here, we assume now we have a slope here, and it's clear to you that the slope represents the true mass flow from one grid cell to the other much better than the constant uh, values here, okay? And now we use for this psi in each grid cell, psi i, a polynomial. It is, it's an interpolation polynomial. And it's clear if you look at this grid cell j, you know, we need the slope here of psi in this grid cell, and it comes from looking what values we have one grid cell before on um, one grid cell after, okay? So the slope of psi in a grid cell j is given by the values, by three values, psi j, psi j minus one, and psi j plus one, okay? So we can calculate the slopes here from the other values which are left and right here, okay? So we get for f in, this was our first order value here which was the constant, just uh, to go briefly one slide before. So this was just the first order part here, just this uh, spatial, uh, the, this colored box here. And uh, now it's corrected here. And the correction comes by doing a, a corrected value by taking the slope, which we call delta j, minus one from this grid cell here, because here we need to change the slope here and then we have here a corrected flux here and by the so-called second order flux, okay? By a straight line, most simply. This would be a linear interpolation polynomial here. So we, and, and this delta psi is given by the, by the derivative times delta x and which we call the so-called undivided difference numerically here. So we have then for the interpolation polynomial, we have the value at the point plus x minus xj delta x, this would be the point here uh, uh, at the side, at the, at the uh, edge here, yes, times the slope at this corner here, okay? And psi i of x is evaluated in the middle of the purple area here. In the middle of this purple area here, we evaluate the function of psi and we get this expression here, okay? Don't forget the sigma here is a delta t divided by delta x, and this moves us here in the middle of this purple value here, okay? Good. 
Yeah, so we correct this. This was the question before. A piecewise constant function would be very simple minded and would give only inaccurate results. I will show you some examples in a moment here. Okay, so we correct this. We have a first order flux here. The upwind method is just first or we correct it to a second order upwind scheme. And nothing has been said yet about this delta psi j. How do I approximate the slopes? The unknown, the unknown slopes of this, because remember, numerically, you only know the value at these grid points, psi j, you know, psi j plus one, psi j minus one, you only know the values of this unknown function at certain grid points, but you don't know the slopes, okay? The slopes need to be calculated from these grid point values, all right? And there's different possibilities. Okay, I have given you some here. A, psi j zero, this means we have a piecewise constant function as before in the upwind scheme. This is what we call first order upwind scheme. Then we can take one sided differences here. The from, oh no, the from scheme is centered. Okay, centered derivative from scheme, one sided uh, differences here. Beam warming scheme, upwind, Lux Wendorf scheme, downwind slope. So you can and see how we calculate the slopes here. And if you compare these functions here with this diagram here, so here we have these different variables here, psi j plus one, psi j, psi j minus one here, you can see how these slopes are calculated here, okay? And very often used in, in, in codes like Fargo, for example, which is frequently used also, the code that I am typically working with myself um, is given there, you, delta psi j is given by the geometric mean of the oops, um, of the uh, slopes here and given by this quantity here on zero otherwise here. Okay, so this slopes here, now I would like to draw, unfortunately, on a blackboard, which I cannot do here. Uh, this is an average of the two slopes here. This is you take, if you want to calculate the slope, let's say here in this point, you take the average of this slope and that slope here you take a suitable average, the geometric average of the slopes here, of the left and right slopes. This is given by this expression here. And what this does is it maintains the monotonicity of the flow. You don't generate new maxima in the flow where none have been before. That's the, that's the important point. Monotonicity preserving slopes. And this is the, the key of many numerical schemes nowadays, okay? The point being is the following. Here, if we had chosen this slope here at point J steeper, so there would be a jump here. Imagine this would have been steeper here, the slope. There would be a little, at this point, there would be a jump then, a discontinuity, and this is what this scheme does not create, okay? That's the point. Okay, now I show you some examples how these different schemes behave, yes, in the numerical solution here, okay? Good. Before I doing so, I will concentrate here on the lux wendorf slope here. This is a very interesting slope. It doesn't look like here, it looks, looks very harmless, yeah, no, not very interesting at all, but if you plug it into the equations, it begins to look interesting. And I am doing this now very briefly here. So we use now this slope here, yeah? Uh, in the equations before here, we plug this in here, okay? And everything which we have seen here before, and if you do that, you get to the following here, okay? We start out from time level Tn. So here on the vertical axis, we have the time level always, yes. On the horizontal axis, we have the spatial discretization. So we have the middle psi n at grid point j, and here j minus one, j plus one. So we have here time level n plus one, and we go first to intermediate time level, okay? It's a two, the lux wendorf method is a two-step method where well, we first step to one intermediate time step here. So here we go from n to n plus one half at the intermediate point, okay? If we do that, here's the values here, which we call tilde here because it's intermediate value here. We take one half of this value. So we take the middle of this value here at time level Tn minus our sigma again here divided by Psi nj plus one minus psi n. So we take here the centered, 
the forward time-centered scheme, which was initially unstable, okay, as, as I've told you, but we use it twice now. So we, for these two values here at the intermediate time level, we use formally the unstable forward time-centered space method, but then we combine it to arrive here at psi j n plus one, which is then given by this expression here on the right, uh, on, on the bottom page, here, number 44, okay? Yes, and this is a two-step procedure, a predictor step and a corrector step, and we arrive from time level Tn in this two-step procedure at time level Tn plus one. And by construction, this scheme is second order in space and second order in time. Okay, by construction, we, of course, we're always time-centered and space-centered, and this means it's second order in space and time. Okay, and you will see if you go through the equations, this can be left as a little exercise. If you plug in this slope into the previous equations, this is equivalent to the lux of method. Okay, so this means that this upwind scheme, even though it looks like you had only the first order time derivative, can be made explicitly second order by choosing the right slope here. Okay, this is very interesting to notice. Okay, this can be done, but just by plugging in everything that I have said into the equations and check whether equation 44, 44, sorry, <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong screen, whether equation 44 is really the same that you would get using the lux of slope in this equation here before. Okay, this is an, can be left as an exercise for you guys. Yeah, so in, in, the, in the long coffee break, you can do it. No, no, I'm just kidding. But this is very interesting to notice. So even if so, I mean, the message is even if so, the scheme, the upwind scheme looks first order in, in, in time, it can be of higher order depending on the numerical slope that you use. Yeah. That's the message here. So now we come to the project that you have to do. So I, I do this already in the middle of, the, of these um, slides here, since I never know how much time I have afterwards, how slowly I speak. I hope, by the way, my speed of going through the lecture is okay. For some it may be too slow, for some it may be too fast, but I hope the average will be nevertheless fine for you. Okay, so linear advection problem using the second, first order and second order upwind scheme. How does it go? Okay, and as if you read through the project, the project is that you have initially a function psi of x at t equals zero, which is given by this here within it. So this is zero here. So within the interval here, minus 0 0.3 to 0 0.3, we have the, um, the value of one here and outside it's the value zero here. And this is then transported with the transport velocity equal to one to the right-hand side and it moves to the right-hand side, okay? So it, it would disappear. I mean, you can imagine if it moves with the velocity one to the right-hand side, if we start out at zero here in the center, after times 40, it would have moved to, to 40 to, to x equals 40. So that means you would need a very huge grid with very, very many grid points. So what one does here is one uses periodic boundaries, okay? So whenever this little box here moves out on the right-hand side here of, of our, let's say, interval here, minus one to one, imagine this was zero initially, zero here. So in, in minus one to one, then if it moves out on the right-hand side, oops, if it moves on the right-hand side out of the domain, we plug it in on the left-hand side again. It comes back, okay? The right-hand side, x equals plus one, equals, is, ident or not equals, is identified with the left-hand side, x equals minus one here, okay? So whatever goes out on the right-hand side comes back in on the left-hand side, okay? And then you look at it after the time 40 with different numerical methods here, okay? And we have here the variable sigma here again, which is A times delta T over delta X, which we call the current number. Okay, so these are now different solutions here of this problem here, a discontinuity initial, 
yes, which moves with a constant speed through the grid. How does its property change in time when you use the different numerical methods that I have shown you so far? Only the linear advection. It's linear because A is a constant here. So, and the analytic solution is in this diagrams here, this, these diagrams give now the solution of this here after t equals 40 with 600 grid points. So very, very many grid points within minus one and one, you have 600 grid points, okay? And this is the upwind method here. And, and you can see the red one is the analytic curve because of the periodic boundary condition, this profile always comes back and it's always the same. So, so it does never change. Yes? If you look at it at integer, let's say time levels, yes. And, and since it's minus one and one, so we have a total length, total domain. Here we are, total domain length of two. So at every even time, it would be at the same location here. So you can see here, the green stuff here is the numerics and the red thing here is the analytics here. So you can see here the upwind scheme, as you can see, just spreads out the analytic solution. And this is what we call diffusive. Diffusion spreads out initial discontinuities. And this is exactly a Gauss profile. As you can imagine, it looks like a Gauss profile, and it is a Gauss profile, okay? Good. If you use the slope here, this slope here, which we call Van Leer slope, I didn't do it here, I wrote it here, Van Leer. He was, he was and is, and maybe, a Belgian scientist, and he developed this in the 70s of the last century, yes, 1973 or something, he, he looked at this, Bram van Leer from Belgium. And uh, if you use that slope here, you see that you get this green solution, which is much better. So second order in space, yes, gives a much better solution here. If you use the lux wendorf method that I have shown here, which is this method here, you can just, just use this equation here, these two here, or you plug this slope into our previous equations, which is the preferred solution in this case, uh, then you find this behavior here. And you can see while it's not diffusive, so the width here is sort of similar, so it resolves the edge here uh, quite well, as you can see on both sides, but it leads to oscillations, uh, to numerical oscillations after the edges here, after the slopes, okay? So it's, this is called dispersive, okay? That means that the solution is oscillating after discontinuities usually, okay? And you can check what Oops, uh, these other things are doing by yourself if you plug in these slopes here. You can see what happens to the solution then. Okay. Guesses are welcome. Good. So these are the different things. So you can see, yes, the preferred way to go looking at these results you get would be this one here. So you have here a slope which is monotonic, as I said before. And this slope here, as you can see, is much more complicated than these slopes here, okay? And this has the advantage that the analytical solution is represented much better, okay? It has, however, a very strong disadvantage that it's very hard to analyze analytically the properties of these slopes because it's highly nonlinear, and you cannot go with the standard linear approaches of studying, for example, the stability of the schemes and so on. With these nonlinear slopes here, this is impossible, essentially. So you have to rely in parts also on experience here and get some properties you can get, of course, by some stability analysis, but it cannot be done in full like you can do for these linear equations up here. I just look at this. The cursor is following with a few seconds after I move it, actually, but it's still moving. Good. Okay. So this is what you should do in the project. Okay. Now I could release you, of course, and tell you, well, wow, um, this is um, 
this is um, what you can do. Now I wait for two hours and then look at the results, but this is not what we will do. I hope that Sari will keep you busy in, in working on this wonderful little problem there. And then uh, you can discuss it uh, on Friday in more detail. I would like to give more a, a background on numerical hydrodynamics in my following slides. Okay, there's a question what is, that is called by Muhammad, uh, what about their time complexity? You mean of these slopes, I guess, yes? The time complexity of the slopes. I mean, these are only spatial slopes here, yes? I mean, if you look at these, these slopes, the delta psi j, the delta is only, uh, at, is only a spatially uh, uh, variable uh, that here, and all the values that you can take here on the right-hand side here, they are all at the same time step n at the known time step here. You always choose the variables at the known time step here. Okay. I hope this answers this question somehow. On the right hand side, they are all variables at the time level psi n at the time level n. Okay. There is no the, the time derivative is only on the left hand. It's only on the left hand side. Okay. Now, having said already that some schemes are unstable, I would like to give you some indication how you can analyze the equations directly and see possible instabilities before you even do some simulations. But of course, we all know the first thing is to do, to write a code, do some simulations, they come out whatever as badly as they can, lots of instabilities. And after that, you begin thinking, oh, wow, maybe there is some problems with the time step, for example, and you try to analyze it. So, uh, but this is what we all do. We first play around with our codes and, and program, and, and after that, we begin thinking. Yes, and sometimes it's useful to do this before, but Okay, this is what life is like, I think. Okay, how can we analyze this equation here? And there is a method by developed by von Neumann in the 40s, 50s of the last century, uh, who was working in numerical analysis quite a lot, and he has developed something like called artificial viscosity methods and so on. And, and um, his methods here are still uh, very, of very mu uh, much use. Okay, so... He basically you plug in a Fourier series for your numerical uh, solution here, and you look here as a simplifying procedure at one component in your Fourier series, which you call here psi j n. Okay, and we write this as an amplitude v n. I don't know why I call it v in some paper maybe v. This is an amplitude of this component of the Fourier series here. And then E i theta j here, where, oops, where i is the imaginary unit, square root of minus one, and j is our grid point. So j is our grid point, while i is i, okay? <laughs> and um, so, and theta is, uh, let's say, a, a variable which is defined by the grid uh, structure here. So it's just a constant. In our, for our cases, it's just a constant here, would be delta x over L or something like this. Okay. Now we plug in this ansatz here into our equations, into our linear numerical equations, and see how these individual components, the, the Vn, evolve. So we plug it in here, and on the left hand side, so rewriting our simple upwind method here looks like this here, as I've written it down here, okay? And for each psi here, we plug in our ansatz 45, okay? And then we get on the left side, we see we get Vn plus one, theta uh, Ei theta j, Vn Ei theta j. And then here we have our sigma Vn here, and here we have the difference, we are here, at phi, uh, at, at the grid point j minus one minus grid point j. I brought this one here. This is all on the left hand side. I took it over on the right hand side. That's why we have j minus one minus j here. So this is then this equation here. Directly by plugging in equation 45 into the finite difference equation 47, and then we arrive. At, equation, at this intermediate equation, and finally at equation 48 by dividing by Vn and Ei theta j, because this is a nice complex number, we can divide by it, and this is uh, just the amplitude. And we arrive at this last equation here, okay? And you can see 
that the uh, uh, amplitude ratio of time step n plus one divided by time step n is just given by this expression on the right hand side. Now, the idea, and this is complex, so this is a complex amplitude also because we have the complex numbers here. So the idea is now that we have only a stable scheme if these Fourier amplitudes are not increasing during one time step. It's clear if you have an ever increasing Fourier amplitude of one of these uh, Fourier, uh, one, of, one part of the Fourier series, then you would get an unstable scheme and the whole solution would blow up. And this is what you see if you take, for example, a too large time step. I will show you in a minute or so. I will, I will come, I will have the time in, in my, my eye, sorry. <laughs> I will make a little break when it's uh, uh, time there. Um, so we can see here, this is the ratio of amplitudes and we would like to have this smaller than one for stability here, okay? So the stability, so we calculate the absolute value of it. Remember, these are complex value variables here and call this lambda of theta as a function of this quantity theta here. And if you take, take uh, this quantity here, you can see it looks like this. So to get the uh, the absolute magnitude here squared, you just multiply this by the con complex conjugate here. So here we have the original form multiplied by the con complex conjugate term here. We arrive at this term here. We can expand here, as, as you know, we can uh, rewrite this here as the cosine function here, E minus I theta plus E I theta is cos theta, two cos theta here even. And um, then you can see this here, and you can arrive finally at this expression here, okay? So you can see here that this absolute value of the amplification factors here give you lead to this equation here. So primarily it depends on this variable theta, which is related to the grid point of your numerical solution here. And this in quotes current number Current, yeah, current uh, uh, number uh, sigma here, okay? And this should be stable if this amplification factor is always smaller than unity. Then this is stable. And for the upwind method, you can check that for all theta, you want to have it stable for all theta. Theta gives you essentially possible wavelength features. So some wavelengths will be unstable. Some can be stable, of course, but you want to have a stable scheme for all different wavelengths that may occur in your solution here. And you can see by looking at this equation here, you can see that this is only stable if this here, sigma, is between zero and one. Otherwise, this whole equation is not stable because sine theta can be one at most here and you want to have one minus four sigma, one minus sigma, it's a quadratic equation. You want to have it always smaller than one and then sigma must be between zero and one here. And this, if you rewrite write then sigma, this gives a limit on delta T because you have your grid, let's assume you fix your grid first, your delta X is fixed and now you want to have the time step, you can advance your solution to have a stable uh, 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 solution always, then delta T must be smaller than delta X over A. This is what you find, and you add some sort of current factor here, yes, which must be smaller than one. So one would be the absolute maximum here, but typically you add it a little bit to be on the safe side, you add a little bit a smaller value here, for example, 0.5, okay? And there's a very famous theorem by Courant, Friedrich, and Levy. I think this is already much older, even before people started numerics. No, um, there is no explicit, consistent, and stable finite different method which is unconditionally stable. That means for all delta t. That means you always have an instability for some values of delta t. That's a famous theorem, I think, from last century. So there is a question, I think. Is that true? There's just It just says hi. Is that a question? Okay, it says something about this current, uh, current number here, FCFL. A factor of 0.8 has been recommended in the exercise. Yes, I mean, this is true. Uh, in the exercise, I, re I said it's 0.8 here, the current number here. You can also use 0.8.
Yeah, quite often people use 0.5, but if you want to be fast, you can use also 0.8, and you can check what the difference is between 0.8 or 0.5. Okay. Yeah. In general, there is no general rule. It depends um, what you like to do. Yeah, I mean, um, th the point is, in this simple example, I have used a constant spacing of grid points, okay? A constant spacing of grid points. Uh, and for this, you can derive this criterion. But in real applications, in real applications, you have varying grid sizes, okay? So it's the smallest. If you look at this criterion here, so if you have a varying delta x, it's clear that the smallest delta x will determine your time step size. So if you have a strongly varying spatial grid size, it's of course very good to take a larger current factor, 0.8, okay? Because otherwise you would be limited by the smallest grid cells somewhere in, in your domain and you would have very great difficulties in advancing in time. Yeah? So you want to reduce the computational time. For that, you would need a current, number, a current factor, which is as large as possible. Um, but, and then don't forget the equations are in principle nonlinear. Yes? And for nonlinear schemes, uh, quite often or sometimes this uh, stability analysis that you have here don't really apply. So it's also good to get a little bit lower. Yes, then the maximum value, okay? Good, so I hope this helps a little bit. So there is no, it cannot be larger than one, this is very clear, but this, this method, this stability analysis has only been applied to linear equations. We're always dealing with nonlinear equations, so it's always better to be a little bit below this maximum value. It depends also on the problem, there is no general rule. 0.5 is a sort of secure thing, but there are certain problems where you even have to go lower, okay? If you're very dynamic, lots of shock fronts, lots of different densities, then of course you can get even lower values. It's not a promise that this will work for all instances here, okay? There's a lot of, let's say, personal experience goes into this here. For linear problems, you can calculate it directly and you will see that your numerical solutions are actually stable until CFCFL 0.9 even, you can play around, okay? I hope this answers this question somewhat, okay? This includes a sort of security measure, this value 0.5, for varying grid cells, delta X and so on, non-linearities. Good, this was stability by von Neumann, the so-called von, von Neumann stability analysis. I think I will just cover the stability stuff and then we'll make a break, okay? So don't panic, the break will come. Okay, an interesting concept one can introduce here is the concept of the so-called modified equation. This is a little bit technical. I cannot go into all details here. The idea is the following. You start out with your finite difference equation 51, okay? And the idea is, um, the idea is, I will answer a question later. The idea is that um, we go now from this finite difference equation, we go back to a differential equation, okay? That means we try to substitute for these things here the Taylor expansion again, okay? We know if we do a Taylor expansion around the time step level N, yes, we contain, we arrive at terms like this here. So we can now for this psi n plus one here, we can plug a Taylor expansion in time at time n and step forward a time step delta t, okay? So we, and then we plug it in here. And this gives here, for example, if you go here, this here would give you deep psi over dt delta t, second order derivative of psi delta t squared, Okay, but then you subtract this one here again. So this, these two terms here in this equation are those two terms here in this equation, okay? The first two terms in equation 51 are the first two terms in equation 52. And the same you apply for the spatial derivative here. So these two terms, if you plug in the full year exp uh, uh, Taylor expansion, sorry, Taylor expansion in space now at this point here, so we get this expression here. So we, as we assume uh, or we plug in a Taylor expansion for our variables here in the equation 51. We, it says what we are doing here, we derive by the uh, uh, differentiate, uh, divide by delta t, substitute for sigma here, and then we arrive at this equation here. 
Okay, so we can see here that if we now use the wave equation, this equation, we can get here by taking the second derivative of our uh, analytic equation here. We can see that it fulfills the wave equation here. Yes, so we can see that we have um, uh, we, we have this relation here, and then we can see that this equation 53 is equivalent to this equation 54. It's mathematically equivalent to this. And this, here we can see, uh, we call now our, let's say, function psi here, we call, we denote now with an index n because it's the modified equation. It, it's not the original equation. It is that partial differential equation that resembles the finite different equations. That's the interesting concept here. So we have come, I mean, this one here was one possible way, the upwind way of modeling our original equation that we had, okay? And we went back and saw that the finite difference equation here, this one here is equivalent, let's say to this partial differential equation, which is the original one on the left-hand side, and we had zero here before, but the numerics added this term here. And you can see here, this is a second order spatial derivative here, which is a diffusion part. So we can see that the upwind method adds a diffusion property to the original equation. Okay, and this is what we could see in the numerical solution. In the numerical solution, we saw that it showed a uh, diffusion of our property here. I will go back to this in a moment. So we can see here second spatial time derivative here, and here's the diffusion coefficient even, okay? And you can see here, if you take the sigma equals to one, okay? This means current number one, current factor one, not 0.5, one, you get zero diffusion you would get the analytic solution here, okay? Yes, if you take here in this equation here, yeah, if you take a current factor of one, you get the analytic solution. Why is this? Because then you just move with your profile in one time step, one grid cell further, okay? Then you get exactly the analytic solution. This is of course, uh, in, in only for this very simple problem, this is possible to do. But in general, this is, of course, impossible to know here. So you can see here, this was our upwind part. You can see it's nicely diffusive. It's exactly a diffusion process here, which is given by this modified equation here. And you can even calculate this whole part here would be the diffusion coefficient of it. And you can calculate it in advance. Okay. The finite difference equation, the FDEs, add a diffusive term to the original PDEs. There was a question how one can check our results, that our results does not from, suffer from instability. Well, if the, if the solution blows up in time very quickly, then you would know that you have a numerical instability, okay? Usually if you're a little bit above the limit, it will immediately blow up exponentially. And this is the clear sign that you have a numerical instability. Otherwise, sometimes it's not so easy to distinguish a numerical instability from a physical instability. Yes, because you can have a, you model a physically unstable problem. And so you want to distinguish, of course, physically processes, physical processes from numerical processes. This is sometimes not so easy. And you need to have some physical insight into the problem to, to be able to distinguish numerical effects from physical effects. Still difficult for all of us to do, okay? So we have the diffusion coefficient for the, let's say, um, uh, uh, um, uh, first order upwind method here. And since it's bigger, then it's a diffusion coefficient. If it were negative, it's even worse than anti-diffusion thing, okay? And this way to go through the modified equations to study the stability here is called the Hirt method here, okay? So here we can also see uh, something for sigma. Sigma must be between zero and one, yes? If, if sigma would be, let's say, uh, uh, such that this would be a negative diffusion coefficient, it would um, also be disastrous here. The lux vendorov method, if you plug in this modified uh, approach into lux vendorov you find this more complicated equation. There's no diffusion visible, but it has a third order, this third order term here, which we call 
dispersion here, okay? Waves, let's say, depending on uh, um, their wave number or the frequency, move, propagate with different speeds. That's the problem here, okay? And here they are too slow. That's why we had the oscillations behind. You could see here, here we have the oscillations here behind the front. Let's say the waves that are emanating from this discontinuity are propagated too slow in the lux of method. And you will see in beam warming, they are too fast, for example. Okay, modified method. Do I have here, here I was, the time step, I will just do one, two minutes and then I'm done, okay? I hope this is fine, then I have a nice break. Um, from these considerations, we can see that we cannot solve our hydrodynamic equations um, with an explicit method here. Uh, with using any time step, but we have the limitation here. From our advection part, we saw that the time step must be smaller than this here. And this means essentially that in one time step, the fluid cannot cover more than one grid cells in size. I mean, this is physically also very intuitive here. Yes, you cannot transport mass in one time step over 10 grid cells. Okay, this is not possible. Physically, uh, you can do this, of course, but you would have expected it numerically that it wouldn't be senseless to do. And uh, it's interesting that the mathematical analysis shows you exactly that. Okay, what you have physically expected is also mathematically not possible in this case. In the more general case, we have also sound waves, okay? And the sound waves gives an additional a reduction in time step, which we call current Friedrich Levy condition, the so called CFL condition. There you replace the fluid velocity A by, an, by the sum of the fluid velocity plus the sound speed. That means no information, no information can spread in one time step more than a distance of one grid cell. This is the physical meaning. And this is very intuitive again. Yeah, so physically, you want that the information that you that is propagating is smaller than one grid cell, the distance over which it can propagate, of course. Okay. And here you introduce again the correction factor here. Yes, because of several unknowns. We have discussed this a little bit here. Yes, since this these derivation of the current free levy conditions also coming from linear analysis. And uh, our whole system is non-linear, and we need con some corrections for this. Then we, then we have a non-equally spaced grid, and so on. So we better take something like 0.5 here, for example. Only implicit methods, okay, have theoretically no limitations on delta t. Implicit method would mean that you use also on the right-hand side the new values. I will come to this when we discuss the diffusion equation, what implicit method really means. Explicit method means basically that you have your values of a variable at time step n, and you only need those to calculate the new values explicitly from the old ones. Okay. Good. And this is shown graphically here. Yes, uh, graphically here. It is shown in this diagram here that you have a stable scheme when you can collect here's your grid, grid cell, the spatial grid cell here in the X space in the X direction, time in the Y direction here. You want to have the solution at these open uh, circles here and you need to collect your, your let's say, numerical, your numerical um, uh, information region must be so large that it contains fully the physically uh, allowed region here. Okay, so this is a stable scheme uh, where, you, where you collect from the physically allowed region here. Unstable scheme would be if your numerical uh, sound cone to speak in the past is larger than the physical region that you have here. And so this is here uh, the uh, problem here. Okay. Good. So you have to collect everything from your physical sound cone to get the right solution. This is some sort of graphical representation of what I said. And in, in multi-dimension here, I will not go, I can just have these two slides, so that's okay. Uh, in multi-dimensions, it's a little bit more complicated. As I said, you solve the equations um, in, in, in multi-dimensions in the case you do let's say one dimension, 
uh, studies, and then you add them up and have a 2D uh, solution here. You use operator splitting and directional splitting. And this has been put forward in a code which is now nearly 30 years, <laughs> looking at the date. Zeus at the time um, worked out, uh, let's say they, they developed this code, which was online, made online for the first time, I think, a general purpose hydrodynamic code uh, by Jim Stone and Mike Norman. And it has different parts. It has 2D hydro, 3D hydro, it has radiative transport, and it has magneto hydrodynamics. So this was at the time, I think, the state of the art. Now it's a little bit older now, but it's still used and still available for use. Now it's called Zeus 3D, I think it's called. So in multidimensional problems, you just go into the one dimensional directions, first X direction, then Y direction, uh, Y direction, and then Z direction here. Okay, one direction after the other. And you're looking here, for example, at the flow of material across the boundaries of the grid cells, which is denoted here, for example, density in here, in the two-dimensional two grid, you look at the flux through this boundary, through that boundary, through that boundary, and you add up all the fluxes from the different boundaries, and then you get the 2D solution here, of course, okay? Good. I will summarize this now, and then I have a new step here, so I will summarize what I have, you see. Um, the numerical methods should represent the conservative properties. That's why you should need to write the equations in conservative form. We have done this essentially in our sample equation here by looking how much the density, for example, changes in one little box. And so this, these equations would conserve the density, for example. The numerical methods should resemble the wave properties. This is not what I have present. This is what I have not presented to you at this present point. This leads to the so-called Riemann solvers, which is a, a different topic that I do not cover here, and special shock capturing methods here, and um, they are better able to resolve the wave structure of the equations, which is also particularly important for doing MHD, for example. They should be able to, to control discontinuities, and so you always need some diffusion. So all codes that you have, Riemann solvers, these upwind schemes, they all need some diffusion to control instabilities, okay? I will come to this as an, in an example here uh, later on where we discuss a shock, and uh, because otherwise, these discontinuities will lead to an unstable evolution. Some codes have it intrinsically built in. For example, our upwind scheme, as you could see, by certain choose, but by, by choosing the slopes suitably, you would you create a diffusive code and which is of course stable, very, very stable. Yes. And this is so you always need some diffusion for stability, but not too much. To make an un to give an unphysical solution there. This is really a big, uh, very difficult trade off sometimes. You either can add ar artificial viscosity or you do it intrinsically through the method which is done in Riemann solvers. Okay, Riemann solvers have intrinsic diffusion um, to be stable. Okay, and they should be accurate. So, standard today is something like second order in space and time. There's a certain number of freely available codes here. I will not go through the details here. You can click into those. You can look at this in the break or something and, and see what's happening here. And um, they are freely, as I said, freely available. You can download it and, and work with it. What, what we are using presently a lot is Pluto and the Zeus type of method, which is Fargo. I should have added Fargo which is also what Sare used a lot, which is uh, the Fargo code. The Fargo code is based on numerical methods like the Zeus code. It's essentially like Zeus, okay? And modern codes like Pluto are Riemann solvers. So this is the prime difference between modern codes. They're either up upwind codes or they are Riemann solver codes, okay? 